The Brandon Peters Show may contain explicit language and detailed plot points. For more information on the show, stay tuned to the end of the episode. And now, here's Brandon. Happy February 1st. This is The Brandon Peters Show. And today, we'll be discussing the 2007 film Persepolis. And joining me, making her return to the show, you can currently find her brilliance in The Hollywood Reporter, but she's been a presence at Culture S and E! News, the dark goddess of the underworld, Sharara Drury. What up? <laughs> uh, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me back. Yes, and you helped me. It's it's actually longer than people might think since you've been on because you helped me launch the show. So you, we were you recorded well before the show right. even came out, and I appreciate that. So then you and I, I think we first recorded. When was that? When on my old show, I can't remember. I, it's it's been. You know what? I don't know time anymore in the pandemic. I don't either. <laughs> I don't know if it was a week ago or like a century ago. I know it was. I know it was a good minute ago. But um, I also remember how much fun I had, which is why I was down to come back. There you go. And, <laughs> and you know what's funny is I can't tell you what the year was, but I'll tell you this. I, I when I was writing the script for the show, it hit my memory. I remember. I so I reached out to you to yes. be on the show. And then you responded back that you wanted to come on, and I think something. And that day, of whatever year it was, was the eve of whatever year Thanksgiving that was. I remember it. I don't okay. know how. I don't know. I was I, just gonna say I felt like it was like right about holiday. Because you you talked about Dolly Parton Smoky Mountain Christmas. Yes. But, but when we were planning it, like, and then you said, "Yeah, I'm down to do that." I, rem- I for some reason I remember that. Okay. I don't know. No, that, that makes I don't know sense. Why. I remember odd things. It could be in the year 1850, but I'm going to go with it. I'm going to go. My, that's, that's where it was at. Yep. I had, to, <laughs> I had to stop the horses to drink water and we got it. And yeah, because I, I found like I found you researching for another guest on that old show and you okay, were interviewing cool. them and got me information I needed for my show. Uh, and I was like, I really like her. I'm going to put her down on my list to have on my show sometime if she would. And you did. That was such a smart choice. It was a good choice. It was a good choice. And I've had you on. I've I've recorded with you this is our third time, I think. And that other person I've meant to have on again, I still haven't recorded with again. So, right. but she led me to you. So here we are. Hey. <laughs> and and you yourself, you I mean, you have a pretty varied career here. I mean, well, building <laughs> some journalism, and you go back. Your your fame goes back to like high school. Yes. Stuff with your start of your journalism excellence. That's you want me you want me to chit chat about that a little bit? Like you give people ch- a little like a little time warp back to me. time warp cuz uh, you have a great story about this stuff, so. Thank you. For high school, while most kids were I don't know doing <laughs> school things like having like drama with their boyfriends or girlfriends or like not going to economics class where I went to high school is Germantown high school. It's outside of Memphis in the city of Germantown. And it is a really prominent high school in terms of like theater and television, like fine arts, all that kind of stuff. And I was a part of their, I mean, I was a part of all of it. We, we, we coined it, we called it production, but like basically it was theater and television. I really got into the television side of things because Basically, I got the vibe that I was not going to be like a theater star. And I was like, okay, I really like TV. I was such a nerd. I loved editing and playing on back then. It was like, I was like on Avid and stuff. And like early, Lucky. Final, I, early had, final I, Cut I, Pro. Had, I had video toaster. Do you know what that is? No. <laughs> I, am I, should I be glad that I don't know what it is? I just remember I was only whatever the first version of Final Cut was in some kind of Avid News Cutter program. But I just loved it. I was like so excited to work in TV, but to get to like the big thing was that I worked on a documentary my senior year of high school that was about September 11th, the attacks on the World Trade Center, specifically those, the World Trade Center specifically, not the other various things that happened on that like 
horrific day. And the big reason I focus on the World Trade Center is because my father actually was in the World Trade Center and got out and survived along with all of his colleagues that were there that day for the National Association of Business and Economics Conference. That's there. It's called NABE. Uh, or was NABE and Auburn was like a conference there. But anyways, did, I did a documentary about it. I interviewed all of these people that had survived that day. At the time, honestly, I did not think I was going to do a documentary that was going to be for anybody or anyone. It was honestly a processing thing, like for my father and I, and like kind of like for a family, but like definitely for my father and I, because he was there. (laughs) It was a traumatic Mm -hmm. experience and he knew how much I cared about reporting and news and journalism. And he thought it would be something really fascinating to do. And then when I let people at my high school know that I was doing it, they're like, you should submit this for essentially what uh, there are Emmys for a lot of different things, but there are, there are Emmys that you can get in high school. You can get in college. I I didn't know that (laughs) at the time I had no clue that like those were things that you could do. So I submitted myself and I won a national Emmy. It's my only Emmy, but it's, I won it in high school. So humble brag, but I, I got an Emmy for the documentary for the writing of it, which I don't even know how to express like how, proud that both made me and how proud I made my father. And we got to go to New York to accept the award. But yeah, that was, that was kind of like the baby steps into what is now my journalism career essentially. So yeah. It was a kick-ass start. And- I know I, it was, it was an intense start, but it, it was a start. And it, it's interesting because I'm less into hard news specifically now. Like I, I'm now, I'm primarily an entertainment journalist, but I don't know. There were a lot of skills that I gained from that program. So shout out to GHS TV and like all of the amazing teachers there. A lot of them are still there. And even people that I either went to school with or were there right before me are now teachers there themselves. But it's an incredible program. So like if you want your kid to be amazing and you happen to be in the Mid-South, that's a school to go to. I checked out the website. It's crazy. Like It's, it's, it's insane. Like, wow. like if you look up GHS TV and then their theater program, the Poplar Pike Playhouse... It's incredible what they do and are still doing. So, yeah. I went to, I mean, I went to Ball State University, like the, one of the premier telecommunications schools in the United States. And I don't remember, I didn't have a, didn't have a website program like that. <laughs> I know they're big journalism and stuff over there, but I was like, damn, this, this goes beyond. For good reason, they hype it up. And I think I'm just, I don't know, I lucked out going there because I could have gone to, There are a few different high schools I'm sure I could have gone to, but that just happened to be the one that I ended up at. And I'm really lucky for a lot of what they taught me because that school is what made me want to be a journalist, honestly. And where you went to college, was it as intense as the high school program or was it cakewalk? (laughs) You know, I, (laughs) it was like a mini bakery walk because that, That high school experience was very intense. If anyone ends up ever listening to this who knows anything about that program or is from that high school, they know that it was not your typical high school experience. So I went to school, I went to college at USC Annenberg, which is, Mm -hmm. it's it's a very esteemed program. It's, It's an incredible place to go to be a journalist. But I think I was definitely like, I remember my first like intro journalism classes there. You had people who had like, you know, never touched a camera, never worked a tripod, like, didn't really know like how to conduct themselves in an interview. And that's not like necessarily like, I'm not saying like that's bad. Like that's the whole point of going to college and learning these things. Mm -hmm. I'm just very glad that I was like already like, I know what to do. I wasn't nervous about those things and I was really excited to do them. So if anything, it just like made me more prepared for like how tough the world of journalism can be, honestly. But I mean, Annenberg definitely had its own challenges. Like it's a very tough school. I was very intimidated still. I just remember being there and being like, I thought I was a shit. <laughs> and then I get to Annenberg and I'm like, I'm with, e-. and I, my father, who's Irish and is whole, and, and very blunt with the way he jokes, he was just like, you think you're the shit and you're going to go to a school with every other person who thought they were the shit at their whatever school. Yeah. And you're all going to be competing against each other. But I will say this, though, like, as much as he said that and I was intimidated, I made a lot of incredible lifelong friends from that program. A lot of people that have helped me in my career afterwards. And I do what I can to help them, too. And that also is a program that I can't speak highly enough of because it's I don't know. I mean, it's also in Los Angeles, which of like cities that you want to be in to like work in media. Mm hmm. That's a pretty important one. Yeah. (laughs) Like either that, like to me, it was like, I was really honestly considering going there 
somewhere in New York or Northwestern. Those were like my big, like dream schools. And, but USC specifically was like my number one. So I remember when I got the, like the acceptance, I like ran through my like high school hall screaming. No one from my high school, like knew what USC was. Wow. <laughs> I mean, like a few, like maybe some of my teachers did yeah. like, were aware of these things. But like when I'd say USC, cause I grew up in Tennessee, people would be like, Oh, like South Carolina. <laughs> I was like, no, oh, I'm not. Going, I mean, I'm not going there, but I understand. I understand. I mean, like I, I knew what it was because it was my dream school, but like, I just think some people didn't know, but anyways, I don't know. I was, I was very stoked to get in and it's a hard school to get into. So well, I am, I'm very glad that I like made the cut, honestly. Yeah. Well, I mean, US, I mean, when I lived out there, like I felt left out in many a conversations of people that all went to USC. I'm like, I, 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 I <laughs> it's, it's its own like community. I'm, mm-hmm. I will say like, it's interesting though, because like when I moved to LA, I mean, I moved from like Tennessee was very like humble and chill and stuff. And I will say this, there's definitely, because I'm sure people who listen to this, like USC definitely gets a reputation and a hype sometimes for like, there are a lot of privileged kids that go there. You do a lot of spoiled kids to go there. Like there's totally things like that that happen. But I think what was awesome was like, I found a great community of kids who were kind of like me. Like we all kind of came from different places. Mm -hmm. A lot of us were not from California and we were just kind of soaking in the fact that like we, like we made it (laughs) in there. But and it was <laughs> yeah, I I honestly a lot of the times felt like such like an outsider because I wasn't from California and USC does have a large amount of kids that are like either from California or specifically like LA or Southern California. Yeah. So that could be intimidating, but I don't know. I was just excited. I was I, the whole time I was there, my four years there, I was like, I'm just I'm here to soak in all of the experience and something that I also think I'm very appreciative of that has helped me so much in my career too, I think. And just as a person is it was a very diverse campus. And I mean, I'm biracial myself. I'm, I'm half Iranian and I'm, and I'm half like Irish American on my dad's side. So like, I get a bit of that, but like I grew up in Tennessee. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't have like, there wasn't a ton of variety and diversity happening. So like when yeah. I got to go to LA and be a part of Annenberg, I was like, Oh, it's, I mean, it's the world in a city. It's incredible. So I was, I'm very, very appreciative of that experience for sure. Definitely. And then right after there, you land a job at E! News and that's pretty significant. (laughs) You know, what's actually honestly wild is that I got that. So that was an, it started out basically through an internship. Mm -hmm. And the reason I got the internship was so many of these things are like, I look back and I'm like, these were such like strokes of luck. Right before I had the e internship, I had an internship at this place called the Los Angeles Business Journal. I was interning okay. there and the Los Angeles Business Journal's office was in the same, I'm going to say like what unit of buildings is where E was. It was like on one side and E was on the other side of these campus? buildings. It's like, yeah, I guess so it's like campus. Yeah. It's like the will. It's like in Mid Wilshire area for, for oh, people who are. Yeah, it's like right yeah. by like the La Brea Tar Pits and stuff. And so there was the Los Angeles Business Journal was on one side and E was the other. And like every day when I'd come in for my internship at the Business Journal, I'd go across the street, go get like a coffee, and I'd see like E over there. And I was like, Who? What's that? And like I, <laughs> I felt bad. Like I and I was honest. Like when I said this in my interview for E, I was like, I did not like watch it a lot like growing up I was not like obsessed with it yeah I I knew what it was and I was aware of it but entertainment journalism hadn't really crossed my mind in terms of like something that I thought I was going to do Mm -hmm. and I think a lot of it was because I was so like oh I'm gonna go go work for CNN and like be Christiane Amanpour like that that was like what I thought I was gonna do but when I was applying for internships my senior year of college I mean, I, I applied everywhere. Like I, I applied to like the places that I probably would not have worked at like medical blogs and things like, oh. ra- like, ra- like random things. I was like, I just need an internship. Cause I essentially needed like an internship credit. If they it's want like, me, I, they can have me. I, I like, yeah, exactly. I was like, I just, I just need to get an internship somewhere, preferably one that pays, <laughs> but just try and get something. And I got an interview with E online. And I remember <laughs> I actually think one of the reasons they did like me was because I wasn't sitting here like, I want to meet Ryan (laughs) Seacrest. Like I was just like, I wanted, I wanted a varied experience in journalism because I was like, Mm -hmm. I've worked 
for a business journal. I had worked at CanBC as an intern, like just doing local news. Like I wanted to see what all the different options and and fields were before I like really settled on what am I going to do out of college. And I hadn't really thought about entertainment specifically. I had been leaning for a long time into maybe in college, like doing human interest stories or documentaries or like feature pieces, but like not entertainment or pop culture. E changed all of that for me. When I worked for E online, I was like, oh my God, I didn't realize that I could like cover. And I don't know why it took me this long to figure this out. I was like, I love pop culture. I love film, video, video games, television, comics, like everything. And you can do that as a job. Hmm. You can cover this stuff, like talk about it and get paid. I was like, what? I, I, I did not realize that that was like an opportunity. And so when I took that internship, it blew me away. I met a lot of incredibly talented people. And I also remember being told that to kind of give like a, a little bit of story, like there was like one of the days we were, all of the interns were rounded up into a room. We were like kind of getting introduced to one another. And we were all being asked the question of like, basically, who is it that you'd want to be? Like mm-hmm. as a journalist, like who is it that you aspire to be? Like, and every single person in the room was like Ryan Seacrest, Julian Rancic, Ryan Seacrest, Julian Rancic, because we're at E. And they got to me and I still was like, Christian Amanpour. <laughs> I was like, that's who I want to be. Or I was like, or just like me. Like, I want people to know my name one day. Like, wouldn't that be awesome? And I remember later being told they were appreciative that, like, I wasn't. And again, no shade if you wanted to be Ryan Seacrest. I mean, he's had an amazing career. But I think it was kind of just like, hey, like, you're a little different. You're, like, a little quirky. We like that. And I think that's kind of what helped me eventually get my job there because I, I interned for a semester. I graduated in May of 2011. And I just hustled every single week trying to get a job. Everybody who's done the hustle knows. Like, I mean, I was, I was sending out resumes until like my fingers bled on my computer. I was like, I'm just trying to get a job somewhere. I was doing freelancing. I ended up actually freelancing for a dentist's office working on their website. So I did some Mm. of the medical stuff. Like I, I just did a lot of random jobs and then But with E, what I did was the person who oversaw my internship, I emailed that person every single week, Mm -hmm. every single week. And I just said, is there a job? Is there a job? Is there a job? And every single week, this person was like, no, like, I don't have anything for you. But a few months after that pushing, they were like, you know what? We just had something open at the news desk. Like, why don't you come on in for an interview? I've, I've let them know that I think that you might be a good fit. And I got that job, I think, within a week of applying for it. Cause I think someone else had just left the news desk and essentially at EA I worked at the news desk for, I th- think it was like six months. It's, it's, it's crazy looking back. I'm like, I feel old <laughs> like, trying to think back. I, but I essentially, I worked at the news desk covering breaking news, like everything from like, did someone get arrested or get like a TUI or like, did someone die? Like when you get an obituary ready mm-hmm. to like bigger feature stories And then during my last year or so there, I remember working at the desk and thinking, I want to do something more than just cover like the random breaking news stuff. Cause you weren't also really covering it yourself. You were gathering all the information for other reporters to put together for a story. And what ended up happening was Melanie Bromley, who is now there, I believe she's like their senior news correspondent there. She was coming over from Us Weekly because she ran Us Weekly for, I think initially it was in the UK and then she was the editor in chief for it in the US. Mm-hmm. And she came to E to be their senior correspondent. And I remember watching her cover like the Olympics and how she found ways to like cover pop culture in the Olympics. And I was like, she's such a creative person to figure this out. And I was like, I want to work for this person. So I literally went to her office, Mm. asked if I could have a meeting with her. And I was like, I want to work for you. I don't know how, don't know what, because I technically work over here at the desk. And I don't know if I'm even allowed to be doing this, but let me work for you somehow, some way. And she was like, okay, I need an assistant. So basically you're going to be like my production assistant. Right. But when you want to work on stories, I'll let you work on them. And that was like my last year there was working with her and doing a lot of the things I did before, but getting opportunities where I could to cover bigger things and get exclusive in that. I guess that kind of a, of a reporter life. And she was, I don't know how else to say this. Like she was intense. She was, she was a very 
no funny business boss, but at the same time, I really appreciate everything that I learned from her because kind of like the way that my high school was like such a wild and, and like unique and experience working with someone like Mm -hmm. her also helped me. I developed a thicker skin because of her. Okay. And I think that's like very important to have in this industry because you're going to get told, I mean, whether you're covering it, like trying to act like even now people who are trying to like be on social, do podcasts, like any of these kinds of things, it's, it's a lot of no's and it's a lot of failure and it's a lot of challenges, but I'm really glad that I got to work with her because she was really no nonsense and just helped me develop. Yeah. Like th- those abilities that you need to succeed, I guess. Right. And really it just succeed in Hollywood. And I'm appreciative of that too. Right. Exactly. And we were just talking earlier, like with the thick skin, tell me no and I can move on. Thank you. Yes. I can, <laughs> right, I can take exactly. a no. Just tell me the no. You're ghosting stuff. That's a whole nother thing I need to learn. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But from there, there you jump over to Culture S and that's where I knew you from originally. Yes. Back, but you had like a dry spell ish or just kind of a floaty period. Yeah. Between, I, yeah. yeah. So, so essentially from E. So I went from like that incredible like experience to moving from LA and moving to Chicago. And essentially what happened was, is I, (laughs) and as people who fall in love do, I was very crazy about um, this person that is now my husband. So it all worked out. It was all great. But essentially what happened was, is that my then boyfriend who became a fiance when we moved to Chicago, he got into medical school Okay, and he was like, I got to go to Chicago for medical school. And I thought about it. And I was like, I've lived in Tennessee my, my whole life came to LA, got this experience. I had never really taken a big risk though, in mm-hmm. terms of changing things or moving to a new city on my own. Cause like going to LA was like, I was going there for college and I had my like parents support to do that. Right. It was like a little safety blanket. Exactly. So when he was like, I'm going to move to Chicago, I was just kind of at a point in my life where I was like, I wouldn't mind taking a risk. I wouldn't mind seeing what another market has to offer. And if I'm being honest, though, too, I think as much as I did love working at E, I was starting to experience a bit of burnout. I've, I've heard this from a lot of millennials, especially this is because this is something I think I should be honest about, like working in this industry, you can have such high highs, but also go through such low lows. Mm-hmm. And there were elements of work that as much as I was developing that thicker skin, there were some things that I hadn't really like fully grasped how to handle. Like there's a lot of stress that comes with covering entertainment in LA at the time that I was working there right out of college. This is like 2011, 2012, 2013. I mean, I think to put it blunt, I was getting a vibe that like, I wasn't going to be super successful for different things that I like being Middle Eastern, the way that my name was, the kind of aspirations I had for myself. I was getting a lot of judgment that like I would, it it just wasn't going to happen for me. Like someone like me would not be a successful journalist in this field. And there was also just general burnout. Like, I don't know how else to describe it. Like you just get tired from jobs sometimes and you need a break and we kind of need to respect that. So what happened when my boyfriend was going to move to Chicago for med school, I thought, Let me take a risk. Let me move to a whole new city. Let me see what Chicago has to offer um, in terms of media, in terms of reporting, or maybe I want to do something else. Like I I just, I was honestly, it was like my early, early to mid twenties. And I was like, when when am I going to get an opportunity to make that kind of a change and kind of see what happens? And that that's essentially what I did. And I moved to Chicago. I ended up actually getting a job fairly quickly at a women's lifestyle website that doesn't exist anymore. So I don't even know if it's like worth, like it's, I was there for a couple of years and that was a great experience, but like, it's not even like operational anymore, but essentially after working there for a bit, I got into copywriting for a while. I worked in like social media marketing for a while. And a big part of that too, is like, I was like the sole, like financial supporting person in my relationship. Cause my husband wasn't, or cause now fiance, then husband was, um, was in medical school. So like someone had to pay bills essentially. So like, I was like, well, I'm a freelancer isn't going to make a lot of money. So right. I, I probably should try to like do something that'll make money. So copywriting pays very well. Mm-hmm. So I became a copywriter, but During that time, I freelanced. I got to freelance for Hello Giggles um, for a while, which was super fun. And that was just, you know, pretty chill lifestyle coverage, like pop culture, things like fashion, like viral videos, like 
it was just a mix of things. So that was kind of my way to get my creative outlet, but still have a job that, that paid and like got, got them bills paid. And then I think it was actually a few years before we moved. So this would be like 2017, 2018. I think was when I saw the posting for an editor in chief role at this site called Culturist. And when I looked it up, basically I can explain it. It was like a nerdy pop culture site for women. And I was like, this is what I love because I will say this, like E E, as much as I loved working there and, and covering entertainment, it was very geared towards celebrity news and like celebrity gossip, yeah. things like that. And that's not like my interest in when it comes to entertainment. I like covering basically, yeah, in the nerdier end of things. Like I want to cover Star Wars. I want to cover comics. I want to cover gaming or like, you know, uh, Game of Thrones, The Walking Dead. Like those are things that I'm into. I was never going to cover that at E. And so when I saw right. this opportunity here at Culture, so I was like, or even like a Hello Giggles, I wasn't doing it as much. So when I saw this opportunity at Culturist, it just everything, the planets aligned. I was like, this is everything that I want to cover. All the things. Yeah. And I, I applied to that and nabbed that job. I remember crying so much for, of happiness because I don't think it really hit me until I applied how much I missed entertainment journalism. And I was very glad that I found that and got to be a part of that community for a while and working there. And the reason I bring up, like, I like, I think it's important to talk about the, the copywriting thing is because I, at the time when I was a copywriter, remember feeling like a bit of a failure, like, oh, I went to USC Annenberg for journalism and like, oh, I worked at E! News and I did all of these incredible things there. And now I'm a copywriter. And I shouldn't have done that because there's no shame in doing any of these things. And it's totally fine to take risks and some things work out and some things don't. And everyone's journey is different. And I also share it because I've recently been on Twitter and seen like people who want to like make shifts in their career or do get burned out from like their job in media or news and like want to bounce for a bit. It's all fine. <laughs> and and right. it definitely works out because for me, like I got a job at Culturist and that job at Culturist eventually helped me get the job that I have now, which is an associate editor at The Hollywood Reporter. Like All of those things worked out the way they did, I think, to get me to where I am. And I think a lot of it is just kind of being okay with the process Mm -hmm. and being okay with some things not working out. Because I think eventually if you're passionate enough and you work at something hard and long enough, like you'll get to where you want to be. And like, I am now at an amazing outlet and I have an amazing job, but I think I probably wouldn't have gotten it if it weren't for all of these things that had happened before. Yeah, definitely. And sometimes you have to, in life, you get to a point where you have to sort of surrender to certain processes. You're like, all right, I'm I'm not above it. Or you'll understand, oh, that's why that is a a process. So it's very good. And and you're doing good work over there at the Hollywood Reporter. It's definitely definitely good stuff. It's super fun. I love working there. (laughs) I mean, I've seen like you uh, recently had a piece with direct, was it the director of Sound of Metal? Yes. Uh, one of my favorite a, films of last year. Oh my God. It's, it's such, first off, such a good movie. It is. It's everyone, really good. everyone really needs to go see it. Riz Ahmed is not only, I mean, who doesn't want to look at Riz Ahmed? Sorry, but, <laughs> but also he's an amazing actor. This film, I think, is such a unique film that explores. Yes, well, it's, ex- I mean, for obviously for those like who know what it's about, I mean, I'm, I'm like probably repeating. We've like, talked about it on this show a couple times. Oh, it's okay, that good. Yeah. It's that so, good. So if they, my listeners haven't watched it by now, shame on you. Shame on y'all. Shame. You know, please go watch it. Yes. Please support Mr. Riz. It's on Amazon um, Prime. Come on. Exactly. It's an incredible movie, but I think my time at THR, maybe kind of like to touch on like why I would want to cover a film like that is like a big aspect of my career at this point is I really want to spotlight and highlight unique storytelling, impactful storytelling, but also because I'm half Iranian myself, if there are films that have a diverse cast or like are putting people of color at the forefront, whether it's like they are on the screen or they're like behind the scenes, like in some form, like, like directing or screenwriting, things like that, that's become more and more important to me to make sure that I spotlight that. So that's been a big goal of mine at THR. And I've, I've gotten to do a lot of really fun and impactful interviews and hope to continue doing that as well. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, you're very outspoken I, I, and you're a good Twitter follow, I, I would say. <laughs> Thank I think, you. I, think as well I hope y'all enjoy the media. 
No, I mean, I think I think you kind of wear your heart on your sleeve a bit, but um, you provide good like uh, perspective, experience, and stuff stuff like that helps a guy like me who might have overlooked something that could be like problematic <laughs> or something like that, and you lay it out there for an understanding because. I'm always looking for better ways of understanding, right. finding empathy where I'm in entertainment where I'm not, or I might have over like something might have just went by me, but it impacts you or something like that, and you you tend to point those out with frequency, and it's kind of a good and learning experience. I, I you know it's funny because like I there was a time where I was like so shy on social media, <laughs> like when I was in college or out. I mean there was a period where I didn't even really use Twitter at all, and I think it's because. Like a lot of people, even today, you get mm-hmm. worried. Like, oh God, should I say that? Like, it's gonna, everyone's gonna see this tweet. I sometimes do like take a minute before I tweet something. I'm like, hmm, <laughs> do I want this to be up like a week from now? But what you said, I think, is accurate. I'm a very like, I just, I say what I'm. I'm feeling I am a, what is it? I'm a verbal processor. I, I process things very loudly and verbally. And that's how I like just kind of get through life. And anyone who knows me knows that about me. But I also think that's just, maybe it's also admittedly for myself and my career. And I'm, I'm seeing a lot of this with a lot of people right now, but definitely in the BIPOC community mm-hmm. and, and, and women of color, we're just kind of like, fuck it. <laughs> Like say what we think, do it. Say what we're feeling. If something is problematic or we ain't feeling it, talk about it, express it. Because, like you said, you you never know who's following you, and you never know like where what your words. I mean, I do try to also consider that as well, the impact of words. And like, if someone's ever, I, I would never want to hurt anyone or make anyone feel lesser than with my tweets. So, like, I definitely consider that. But for the most part, a lot of my stuff is yeah, calling out things that I think there is an issue or there's something problematic or the other side of it. Hey, no one knows about this film and y'all should know about it. There you go. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like maybe, maybe you haven't heard of this project. One of my favorite interviews I did last year was about the Iranian romantic comedy, a simple wedding. And it's an amazing movie, but like, I didn't think I wasn't sure like who's going to know about this movie unless like you're Iranian and like you're looking for it. Mm -hmm. And especially in terms of like trade coverage, I was like, this would be a really great thing to discuss. So that's hopefully what my followers are finding on well, <laughs> yeah. my social media is those kinds of stories. And that's the great power of like the film writer, things like that, that people understand. They like they focus far too much on like what they have to say about Star Wars right. or Marvel. It's like dude, they, right. you don't need them to tell you to go see that movie. You're going. You're going. They didn't <laughs> yeah. they didn't I, like it big Star Wars deal. is going to be just fine. But yeah. The spotlight. <laughs> right. The spotlight on this what is this? And even if let's say like you write a piece about that. And it's not quite there right then, but someone's always right. going to be looking at it. And you have a documented piece of right. history on that that's there. Absolutely. And I think that's absolutely important. And keep and it has a place for someone looking for more about that film to find sure. it, regardless if it's eight people or two million that's important to hit. And right. Show, and, and I, I don't get, have Chrissy Teigen's following, but one day. One day. One day. <laughs> one day. <laughs> <laughs> In the middle of a revolution. Marjan is growing up. Stevie Wonder. Julio Iglesias. Nail polish. Lipstick. Iron Maiden. <gasps> and about to embark. What's with the punk shoes, huh? It's this on the back of your jacket. On an amazing journey of discovery. Right, you better get going. No more crying. Europe is winning. You lived through a revolution and a war? Well, yeah. Wow. So it's true what people say. Iranians have no manners whatsoever. She told him she was French. (laughs) Now, in a strange new world, as her country changes forever, so will she. From Marjan Satrapi's best-selling graphic novels. Marjan Toko, I love you! Comes the story of a lifetime. In life, everyone always has a choice. About finding the strength. Never forget who you are. And the courage. 
to be true to yourself. I've worked 20 years for this country. The Birth of Venus is one of his most important works. what you call immodest. Well, then stop staring at my butt. Dare me to take my veil off? You wouldn't dare. Persepolis is written and directed by Marjan Satrapi, along with Vincent... Perignon, and it's based on her comic of the same name. It stars Chiara Mastroianni, Danielle Deru, Catherine Deneuve, and Simon Abkarian. In English, the redub, you'll hear Sean Penn and Gina Rowlands replacing the roles of father and grandmother. Persepolis tells the tale of a precocious and outspoken Iranian girl who grows up during the Islamic Revolution. And as always, Shari, I want to know what made you pick Persepolis to bring to the show? Because it's a big honor to be like, oh, I get to come on the show and pick a movie. So what made you bring Persepolis? Which is an excellent so, pick, by the way. An thank you. Pick. I'm so glad that I'm so glad that you think so. The reason I chose Persepolis, I think it's kind of like a two-parter. One, for me personally, when I I actually read the comics first and then I saw and then I saw the film like years after I first read the comics. But both of that, both of those mediums, I guess, were so impactful for me because I'm Iranian myself and my mother and pretty much all of her siblings and her came to this country right before the revolution. You know, I don't know the exact years, but this my, mo- my mother was born in 59 and she came to the U.S. I think she, when she was like 14 or 15. Right before the 60s, she was like 14 or 15 when she came here. Her parents stayed behind in Iran. And she's always told me about all of this, like all the hardships of like having to leave her country, for her coming to the U.S. and just kind of like being a part of two worlds and that duality of identity. And I think a lot of that is explored in this film which I really appreciate and I think is actually a pretty universal issue for a lot, even especially today with the fact that we have so many people who are mixed, who are a part of blending cultures right now. But for me personally, honestly, it gave me a way to kind of understand what my mother and her family went through because some of them don't even talk about it that much, which it, when you watch this film, you can understand because there's just a lot of hardship, mm-hmm. a lot of sadness, a lot of again, like identity crisis going on. So that's a big reason why I personally like this film because it probably offered me, especially when I read the comics, this movie offered a gateway for me to understand what my mother and her family went through. So that's, that's the number one reason. I'd say the second reason is because knowing that I'd have even a platform like this to talk about, to to Mm -hmm. choose anything. First and foremost, I'm going to try and suggest films that are going to broaden people's horizons, like open their minds a bit. And it was either this or a few other Iranian films that I love personally and I think are really fascinating to watch. But this one's probably the the top because to this day, I still think there are so many people who look at, I prefer using the term West Asia now versus like the Middle East, but mm-hmm. looking at that part of the world and going like, it's violent, it's scary, it's dark, it's conservative. Like, I don't understand it. And this is, I think, not everything you need to know, like you should obviously like go and like read history about Iran too and about the Iranian revolution and understand how all of that happened. But in terms of like a fictional kind of gateway to understanding it, this is a great film to do that. And I would also encourage reading the comics as well. Those are kind of the reasons why I wanted to offer that as a, as something for us to watch and talk about. I'm pretty sure I saw this back in 2007. I'm, I can't guarantee. I, I wanted to say, but it definitely resonated with me a lot more now watching it than I would have back then for sure. And I think it's far more effective like this in an animated form than any live action interpretation of it could have been. Yeah, absolutely. Like, that's one thing I took from it when I when I popped it, when I was watching. I watched it twice for this. And like there's just something about the there's like a it gives it more of a universal flavor as an animated film that I think welcomes in to anything where it could be, if you're, if you're doing a live action, I feel like it could get lost 
in the midst of other films that aren't even like it. Right. To try to, like, you could, uh, like, there's an effectiveness of telling the story of the people that I think something like, that has maybe tried sometimes, like you're, like, on, let's go to, like, Homeland on television, <laughs> fails, to, fails right. to get across in the sort of relatability and feeling of empathy towards the group, no matter how yeah. hard they try. But in this animated one, for, I don't know, it was a lot, speaks a lot more. Well, reason. I think it's there. I think the the beauty of the animation of this film is because there are there. Are, I mean, I don't know how else to put it. There's a lot of dark content happening in this film. Yeah, I think I think for me, one of the reasons that the animation is perfect for this kind of a story is a lot of what you're saying. I do think that things might get. I don't know how else to say it. I I don't think things would hit the same or maybe be misinterpreted or not be as impactful because I think there's a, there's a beauty. I mean, this is why, for example, I'm such a fan of anime because Mm -hmm. there's, there's messaging or sorry, there's, there's messages in the storytelling that when you're watching people and, and real action and for example, in this film, there's a lot of violence. Yeah. Uh, There's a lot of, uh, there's death. Um, there's depression. There's, there's, I mean, there's a suicide attempt. I mean, yeah. th- there were things that I forgot happened in this movie. I forgot that technically the character, like almost like, uh, I guess from an overdose of pills, like I, I forgot all about that in, in, in the fact that she gets so depressed. So these things, I think just, they hit different with the animation. Maybe some of the, the sadness and, and the violence hits it's 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 a softer landing maybe because it's animated yeah i think there's also just something to a lot of the things that she was trying to illustrate come through better with the animation in terms of like with little marjan like the fact that she's or margie i guess when she's a little kid and she's thinking about wanting to be a prophet and she's Mm -hmm. having conversations with god I don't know how that could have been conveyed so well, like with real actors and maybe at the time of the film with like special effects and those kinds of things. Well, it was like a comedic um, aside when they, that happens. Yeah. It's kind of the, the guy, you know, he's, yeah. know, he's a comedian. And then the other guy that's up there later on right. with him. But I think maybe, I guess this is what I'm, what I, as I'm thinking this out loud, this is maybe what I'm realizing is that when it comes to depicting quote unquote, the Middle East, or especially Iran and the Iranian revolution and Islam and all of these things. I think that when you see it in a lot of television shows and in films, no matter maybe like how well-intentioned things are, it's tough for people to see and not like get triggered or not think like, Oh, well, it's just a violent country done. Like that's like the viewpoint I'm going to take away from this. I think there's something about it being animated. Like I said, that, has some of the topics like they don't hit as hard. Maybe it's also just such a universal way of storytelling that people might enjoy too. But I just think also it's it's a beautiful film. Mm-hmm. I oh, think yeah. even though this wasn't like a great scene, I remember crying listening to her uncle Anoush just talk mm-hmm. about his story, about how he wanted basically a better Iran and then watching, I think it was his own uncle get murdered and then him finding his way to Russia. And it's the drawing of the trees and the drawing of the men approaching and the sense of like all all of these like horrible feelings. I don't know how you'd convey that. (laughs) And, And I mean, obviously like there's great actors and there are great directors and there's great cinematography, but that's one aspect. I just don't know how you'd convey it. But the other side of it too, is it was based off of a comic. Yeah. And I think that, for it to stay true to the way that the comic was and presented that way, I love mm-hmm. personally. Because like I said, I'm a huge anime fan. I love comics. And I almost think of it as like, I love The Walking Dead. I'm obsessed with The Walking Dead. I love the comics. And the show is a great show. It's a great personification of the comics. But for a lot of people, like when you, if that was like your first introduction to this story, I think that was great for people to get to see it come to life too. Mm-hmm. So I kind of like it's a two-parter like the violence 
might have been really intense for people to see um, yeah. actually acted out. So it might be great that it came through in a comic. But the other side of it, too, is I'm glad that they stayed true to the original story and like the way that it was designed, I guess, to be told. Definitely. And one thing with the live action, too, that I was I, well, we're, well, before we go away from that, like a lot of times the goal whenever American production or something sets something to Iran or another right country uh, they the the goal is merely suspense and action there's no <laughs> let's it's never it's never a drama or we're just visiting or you know and those things come into play there it's so right. the the goal is either covert operation suspense get him out of there something's going right. he's got the code to this and it's it's always with heightened entertainment and never dramatics. Honestly, you know what? Maybe, yeah, that's it. I agree. And maybe to even like sum up like my very lengthy explanation before, I think a concern I would have had if this had not been illustrated and had been done as a live action film, I fear that it would have focused a lot more on the drama of the violence, the drama right. of essentially, yeah, that that I don't think is what the focus of this story is. Like that absolutely has to get covered in Persepolis. But at the end of the day, it's about a woman going through life, mm -hmm. growing amid all of these obstacles, all of these tragedies. She's processing so much trauma yeah. that as we see, she completely breaks down from it, learning to love, learning to love multiple times. And at the end of the day, trying to understand who she is, because I, I even like wrote it down. One of the quotes that still gets me in this film, like when I rewatched it recently, I was like, this speaks to me and my entire family is when her father, when she's a little girl and she's about to leave the airport to go to, I think it's Vienna. I think that's where she, yeah, she went to a French school in Vienna and it's that her father tells her, don't forget who you are, or where you're from. I mean, yeah. that encapsulates so much of the film. And then near the end, I think there's even a conversation again that she has with like her grandmother about that. It, it's so, it's so interesting, like how this film, even though there's a lot of topics that are being discussed, so much of it really just comes down to, she doesn't know who she is a lot of the time and she's struggling with the fact that she wants to love her country and love where she's from and love her family but she also doesn't know what that is maybe anymore because some of it doesn't right. exist anymore so i don't think that would have been captured as well in especially in 2000 like like probably 2006 when it was like in production in 2007 when it was coming out right. No, they would have focused heavily on even like with the well intentions of the person who created the story. Right. I just think at some point that violence and showcasing like the negative aspects of Iran and Islam in, in terms of like what people think. I should like maybe clarify that what the West wants to see Iran. As. Right. And um, who what knows what the casting would have been like on that, too. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Back then that would have been. Well, we have had Antonio Banderas as someone. Yeah, right. Because this, this is what happens too. It's yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like it, it would have. I, I worry even like with casting. Like, would it have been an authentic Iranian cast? Uh, it, maybe and, one uh, or yeah. in the background, but it would not have. Right. What would the language have been? Because obviously, like I've watched. I I think when I read the comics, obviously it was in English. But when I've watched the film, I've watched it. I think it was initially French. Yeah, it was oh, French. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's right. French. Like it's right. native is French, and then it got U.S. distribution and redone. Right. And you know what? I actually like when I was going to rewatch it recently. I was like, do I want to watch it? And because I knew that there was English dubbing, because I I found like a link to watch it that way. Mm -hmm. I, I ended up just like going because I think for me it's like some of the cast like it's Catherine Deneuve. I was like, yeah, I'm gonna like. She's it. on both of them. So oh oh, both the well, that's cute. Never mind that. Yeah. <laughs> I could have watched it there, but I wanted to watch it. I guess that way but no you're right I, I i really don't even know like how the casting would have been well I, um, yeah well yeah sean like, yeah, penn as the dad actor. okay see that's that's hilarious that's in the voice <laughs> i mean i i think in voice acting i i think you could switch anywhere you go i mean i mean um, i think to i would i'd say like to a degree because i mean i mean obviously like we have like french actors like right doing this, so like but that's also because for, I think like for reasons like that we even see in the story, like she like went to French schools and things like that and like connected with that 
culture, I, mm-hmm. I'm assuming. I say like to a degree, because it also depends on like what we're talking about. I mean, like there's a reason why people don't want like a white guy wasting a poo on the Simpsons. Let me let me let me <laughs> right. preface that. As, as long as you're as long as you're showing opportunity all around. Right. Um, then that's fine. Like Star Wars Rebels had like people of color voicing white characters and stuff. So that's right. No, I um, no, I get what you're saying. I mean, I will say this. I probably think more so though, if this had been cast and this had been in real life. Oh, in real life. Oh, I I think it would have been messy, and uh-huh. I and I think it would have focused heavily on violence, and I think so much of this would have been lost. I think there's just something about the animation that also is what makes this an incredible film mm-hmm. to watch in terms of Iranian cinema yeah. too. Because I mean, even for Iranians who, and, and I mean, I know that there have, I'm not aware of this myself because my family enjoys this film, but mm-hmm. I do think there are probably Iranians who like, I mean, like anything, like any, any nation's going to have criticism about any film that it's about it. Like some people are going to love it. Some people are going to hate it. Cause I think even when I was looking back at reviews of this film, yeah, there was some backlash for some people thinking like, even the aspects of violence that were in it that I didn't think were mm-hmm. too horrible. There are probably some people who didn't enjoy it at all and thought none of it should be in there, but that would have been inauthentic to the story. Like right. she lived through this. Like she, we have to like talk about some of the right. violence that happened and how that affected her. Yeah. Like mentally, emotionally, all of that. Yeah. And I think a lot of the things that would have been lost would have been a lot of the childhood stuff, which is really effective in the film. Yeah. That, they, there's, I can't see that being, mm-hmm the way it is one of the strengths of this was it really pulls in the idea of a child's interpretation of current events of politics we yes. only really get it through her and you get to see you, you see your parents talking about stuff you hear the words you don't know what they mean and then you're like i'm pro this because you know my parents yes. but you have no idea what it is Right. And she's wrapped up in it as a child at the the birth of all this where there's so much to take in. And right. then when at the age where she could understand, she's far away and can't see anything. And it's a really interesting yeah. dynamic. I loved that because that's honestly, I think, why my family and I relates to this film and why I think I took away so much of it myself was because, I mean, that's essentially what happened with my family. I mean, a a little differently for obvious reasons. It wasn't exactly the same, but like my mother left Iran when she, before like she was 16, essentially. And kind of similar to Margie, she went to school initially. I think like, I guess it was, yeah, middle school or high school. She was, I think more probably high school. She went to a Catholic school. I mean, she had like nuns that were like teaching her English. She definitely had those experiences where like people were like, oh, like you're Iranian. Like at the schools that she was going to, the fact that she was witnessing what was happening in her homeland while in a different country. So like Mm -hmm. worried about what's going on in Iran, worried about like how people are viewing her there, worried about like, what's my identity here? All of those things. But I think that's also, especially now, a pretty universal, like I was saying before, like I think that's a pretty universal feeling a lot of people are dealing with because we have, especially in, I think in Europe and in the US, you have a lot of people who are leaving wherever they are initially from and emigrating to different places Mm -hmm. and having that trauma of like your homeland, you're bringing that to your new land. You're trying to be successful. Like, I mean, you're like, you're trying to, you know, just hang out with friends. You want to date, you want to be successful at work, all of these things, but that's in the background. There's trauma in the background. And then there's also the fact that, like I say, again, like, I think a big part of this is like identity Mm -hmm. and being okay with who you are. And like, the struggle of questioning what you are. Cause I mean, there are multiple times through this week where she's like, I mean, she's proud to be Iranian. And then she's like, I don't want to say I'm French. Like I'm not Iranian. And then she's like, no, okay, fine. I am proud to be Iranian. I I mean, I think there are so many people who deal with that and they're not Iranian at all. I mean, I have friends who are, I'm going to screw this up because I'm so bad at this, but like, I think there are a lot of people that are like me that are children of immigrants, essentially. That's, that's Mm -hmm. what I was trying to say. Like there are children. Cause I mean, like I, I was born here. I was born in the U S so I see myself as an American, but I see myself also as an Iranian American. And there's the identity crisis of like, I'm never with Iranians. I'm never Iranian enough. And with Americans, I'm never American enough. And I think a lot of people feel that 
who are from some kind of a minority, whether like you don't feel Mexican enough or Latino enough, or you don't feel Asian enough, like what, what or uh, wherever you're from, if you're not, can I just be me? Yeah. yeah can I just be me? So I think, I think that's also a big reason why I wanted to recommend this film mm-hmm. is because while I think it's very important to watch if you want to understand what happened in Iran in like the eighties and the nineties and all of that. It's also a great film. If, if you've been going through those kinds of experiences and those kinds of struggles, because it kind of shows that like a lot of people are going through it and you're not alone. And there's maybe lessons to learn from that too, Mm -hmm. which I mean, I even think what's also great about this film is like, not everything's answered at the end. No. Her. I kind of forgot that too. Like it's like in like the last like 20 minutes, she's like getting a separation yeah. from her husband. I was like, what? I forgot all about this, but it's kind of showing that like, she's still growing. She's still figuring things right. out, but she's starting to accept more of who she is. Like, I love that scene. It's like the eye of the tiger. Oh yeah. <laughs> And she's like, I'm trying to get back on my feet again and figure out who I am. So many people go through that. So many minorities are going through that today. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I, I think this is like definitely a worthwhile film. Like if you've ever felt like, I don't know where I belong. This is a great movie for you to watch. There you go. I also think, I mean, watching it this way, like I, I like to focus on, you know, like I said before the people, but this could show somebody that's scared of people overseas where just because they all they associate is right wars and tyranny and all this stuff yeah. say, it, it's not the people the people don't it's, like it's this the, the people government. are trapped <laughs> right it's governments that have like the wars is like not it's like, and people. also like extreme versions of things too yeah, like extre- extremists mm-hmm. because i mean we are dealing with that here literally right now i mean this uh, this film obviously becomes a bit relevant here in the united states to be like look what we're f- this is what you're flirting worth here it's what you i man can't even tell you it's like these like i think i when i've been speaking to my mother and people and some people in my family about just the events that are going on here it's like there are elements of it that are such wild flashbacks to what was going on yeah right before, during, and after the Islamic revolution. And I'm sure for people who aren't even Irani at all, like if there's been turmoil in your country, if there's been government changes in your country that have impacted people, like we're dealing with that right now here Mm -hmm. in the US. And I think what's fascinating is, yeah, I mean, amongst the people ourselves, a lot of us are just trying to live our life. We just want basic things. Like we just want to be paid well, we want to live, safe, Mm -hmm. safe lives. We want our kids to be successful. I mean, I think those were some of the moments that really touched me are in Persepolis Mm are moments when Margie's with her grandmother or Mm -hmm. with her mother or father or with her uncle Anoush. And they're very sentimental moments where they just want the best for this little girl. Right. That's super universal. But I think what you're saying too, it's like people hopefully when they watch a film like this, yeah, can see if for anyone, I mean, specifically for Iran, if you have a preconceived notion of a country, I mean, the tough thing is it's like, it's a country that unfortunately, because of so many things that have happened, it's not an easy country to travel to. Mm-hmm. So this is your passport. This is, you your go, yeah. to, this, this is your way to kind of see some of it. Now, obviously, it's about a lot of the past, but that's important in understanding how things are right now. But I also think, yeah, it's a great way to just kind of see I mean, it's one specific story, but it's a story that so many Iranians I know have dealt with. Even if it's like people like me, like I obviously wasn't born there. I obviously did not live during this revolution. I did not go through all of those things, but that stuff lingers (laughs) for for generations, like the trauma of it. I mean, when I have some family members talk about their time in Iran and like going through these experiences... And not just the revolution. I think what I really appreciate in this film is it also talks about the Iran-Iraq war, which I don't think Mm -hmm. a lot of people, I mean, if I bring that up to some people, they're like, I didn't even know that existed. Didn't know this even happened. (laughs) So it's those things that like are going to open your mind to understanding issues over there, why people are upset about certain things. But at the end of the day, the basic things that people wanted were freedom wanting to have a voice, wanting to be respected, 
women having rights. Like these are not wild things. And I also appreciate that the film kind of shows what kind of the, I guess the dynamics of Iran were in terms of like culture ahead of everything. Cause for example, I have pictures of my family from like the fifties and sixties and early seventies. And there are pictures of like aunties with the big sixties bobs and like Mm -hmm. the pearls and like the little mini dresses and like cute little like heels and like wedges and stuff. And it's in Iran and people are like, what (laughs) that was there. That was, that happened. And I'm like, yes, (laughs) people had parties and their people dressed the way they wanted to dress. It's like, it is not an, I think it's wild because when you think of it, so many countries are like that in terms of, and not, and not just like Islamic countries or Arab countries. I mean, there are so many countries that are not the way that they have always been. <laughs> that should not come as a surprise. Right. So like when people look at Iran now, it's like, that is not how it's always been for the, for these people. And not a lot of people enjoy the oppression that's going on. So I think that's why I think this again is a great film because it helps kind of explore that. And show that side of it too. And and hopefully opens people's minds a bit yeah. um, to all of that as well. Yeah, I think this is a key one. Needs to come back up in conversation or be seen or be available. Yes. The availability of it streaming wasn't, well, I think you can rent it plenty of places, but right. like Canopy, it should, feels like it should be on Canopy, the library uh, right. streaming app. It'd be perfect <laughs> for there for people. That Absolutely. Have. It was nominated for Best Animated Feature Film at the Academy Awards. It lost to Ratatouille. That year, there were only three nominees. The other one was Surf's Up. If you remember. What? I didn't realize that. The, I the, power, the powerful movie, Surf's Up. So, I mean, it's it's wild that it lost to Ratatouille. I do, but I know we were discussing this ahead of us recording, but it is kind of one of those things where it's like, I understand the power of like Pixar and these right. things. I would just like to watch these two in a day. Right. <laughs> Watch Persepolis and watch Ratatouille. I mean, I love me some Ratatouille. I even watched the Ratatouille TikTok musical. Yeah. I, 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 I like Ratatouille. But if I were to like say what was a better film in terms of substance. Oh, and no doubt. Animation, no doubt. Look, I understand. Uh, what was, Remy, go, I know you want to be a chef. But but I think this story. But I also under, I can understand at the time. It's interesting because I do wonder... Well, I don't even have to wonder. I think if that, if it were to happen today, that would not happen. I think if this, I think if they were to be going against each other, like in this setting that we I mean, are, at least they right didn't now. lose to like cars, right? That's <laughs> Ratatouille. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Ratatouille. When it comes to to these things, the tough one always loses. Like this, yeah. I mean, this one has something bold to say. This one challenges you. This one's not. It's very emotional. It's not. It, it doesn't shy away or paint so, brushes it, its problems and at the end of the day and a lot of times when it's a, a film from a foreign to the u.s country mm-hmm. eh, we yeah. we know they let their house, an housekeepers angle. and stuff watch them and tell them about it so <laughs> that's a thing too so i, yeah. I th- you know this one that got recognized i guess that's the the win for it though dare i say it should have been up for best foreign language film as well not just animated yeah. I wanted to say, I wanted to go, I'd say adapted screenplay, but that was kind of a stacked year. So it, okay. it's up against No Country for Old Men, Atonement, Away from Her, Diving Ooh. Bell and the Butterf- Butterfly, and There Will Be Blood. That was a stacked year. Yeah, that might have been tough. I'd like I to bring up that Away from Her is a terrific film that many people have probably forgotten about by now, but Sarah Pauly is a really good film. And yeah, that was a that was a stacked year at the Academy Awards, from what I remember. I know... We probably only talk about No Country and There Will Be Blood now, but those are all pretty highly touted. I also films. didn't even like think about this, but I so this film it came out in two thousand seven. Mm-hmm. Gosh, that's when I graduated high school. That's wild. Wow! All right, <laughs> I was seven years removed from high school at that point. I'm just like thinking like that's because I'm actually trying to remember when I actually watched this for the first time. Like early 2000s, like 2003, 2004, 2005. I remember reading this in high school, but the film, I, I don't think I saw the film until a while after it came out. Gotcha. Um, I, th- I thought I thought I had worked on the Blu-ray when I was in California, but I had it's a Sony title. I wouldn't have worked on it. Okay. Um, and I think I do remember, I think I rented it at my uh, fabled blockbuster video oh, that was on... Oh, snap. It was, it was on Sunset, and it was two stories... 
and I remember, I remember just it just the animation on the the cover caught me. I didn't know what it was about. I just rented it because of that. Right. But my blockbuster was on the same street that Halloween was shot, and that's my favorite movie. So that's why I always drove right. a little. I, I drove to the little bit further blockbuster to yeah, rent because I could drive by where Michael right. chased Laurie across the street at the end of the movie. So obviously, I, I would always. I always go that block. Plus, it was two stories, and there was a lot of stuff. Yeah, you think that's of a blockbuster I'm... like that now. I mean, I, I would still go to one if they existed. It makes me sad. Yeah. <laughs> they just, I mean, they just Family Video finally called it quits, so all the chain rental stores are officially gone. So wow. now it's just the Ma and Pa's and you know Collector Hub, which I got to. Gosh, it's gonna be two years ago this year, but I was in Seattle. Uh, hmm. August of 2019, I got to go to Scarecrow Video in that place. Have you ever been up Seattle? No, I've I, always wanted to go. I in fell <laughs> in love with Seattle. So if my wife ever wants to relocate, I will go to Seattle in a heartbeat. Honestly, I, I would, I would love to. I, I've always wanted to visit, and I, because that is literally like I, I know I live in SoCal, and it's wild that I would say this mm-hmm. because of where I live, because it doesn't make any sense. I am about the weather there so much. That gotcha. is, their weather is where I would like live. I am, I like sunny life and palm trees, but mm-hmm. I can only take it so much. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, Seattle, they, they have this scarecrow video. It's this gigantic store. Like, I took my wife's not into this kind of stuff or whatever, but she was impressed with this place. She was like, right. Oh my gosh. So I, I went in there. I was the biggest <laughs> tourist in this place. That's awesome. And it was, it, it's great. And they have screenings and stuff of weird stuff. It's my kind okay, of place, sir. but, um, yeah, definitely. I hit that up before I hit up any dispensaries. So that was my first thing <laughs> off the plane. Went to Scarecrow Video, but yeah, Seattle's a really cool city. I like it, and I, awesome. I'm not paid for by the city of, <laughs> by, city by, of Seattle by, 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 or the state yeah. of Washington, but it's a really great city. So. <laughs> I can't recommend this film enough. It's uh, it's always like on my list of racks when people are just in general like films to watch. I always think people should watch this because. While it's about Iran, like I've said a million times, there's so many universal themes here. But I also just think it's got such a special place in my heart. One thing I will add that I think of, I know I was talking about all of the relationships that I really loved seeing in this film. Mm-hmm. Something I that is my favorite that literally gets just got me in my feels when I was rewatching it is the relationship with the grandmother. Oh, yeah. Oh my God. It speaks to me so much because I, I'm going to get like choked up thinking about it. My grandmother, my mama Jew. So for grandparents, I don't know if all are running to this, to be honest, because probably everyone's got different nicknames. My grandparents would be my mama June and my Baba June. Okay. Um, and you're, and cause June, uh, it's like J U N it's kind of like a term of like endearment. So like, I'd even say like Brandon June, like if I wanted to say okay. like, Oh, like, salam, Brandon Jun. Like, that's me kind of saying, like, hey, you're close with me. And so with my grandparents, it's Mama Jun, Baba Jun for m- grandmother and grandfather. So my Mama Jun means the world to me. She's, like, probably the most, other than my parents and, like, my siblings, like, the most important person in my family. Mm-hmm. And I loved seeing this relationship in this film because, obviously, Mar, she's, she's close with so many people. Marjan's close with her parents. Like, she, and she doesn't have siblings. And uh, her uncle, Anoush, she loses so early, and that impacts her. But it, it, it really kind of seems like that grandmother of hers is inspirational for her. I loved how confident her grandmother was i mean these are things that i just love seeing in any film but especially in an iranian film of a depiction of of just like a confident passionate well-rounded intelligent female who is elderly and i I love the details about like how she kept like lavender flower petals in her bra like (laughs) so adorable at the end of the credits they go back to that they quote or no or father i I know they do a conversation happening okay yeah and it's sweet. And I love that they ended on that because mm-hmm. that's also one of the saddest things at the end is when she's like leaving them. And she was like, that was the last time I saw my grandmother. Yeah. I bawling. I was crying. Cause I think that's also a universal thing. Like we, we have for those of us who are lucky enough, I say to have like a healthy relationship with our parents or our grandparents, you know, that feeling of like, because that is the elder in your family. That is the matriarch or, or if it was your grandfather, the patriarch in your family. Mm-hmm. And we care about these people so much. And that's 
I mean, that's our ancestry, that's our lineage. And especially for Iranian families, there's so much, I mean, I, I would assume this for all families, but like there's definitely in Iranian culture, there's so much respect and honor that you give to these people. Like my grandmother is so revered in my family. She is the queen. And so I just loved seeing, I just have to say like, that was a beautiful relationship. And it's also really beautiful to see that elderly Iranian woman in this family is like, in a lot of ways, like so outgoing, so Mm -hmm. outspoken, so confident and is trying to gift bits of wisdom to Marjan, like through her life. And I think that's, that's just super empowering. And I love, I loved that because I also wonder, like, if we're talking about if it had been in a real life adaptation, like how would that have come through? Right. How would those scenes have played out? I'm sure that would have been okay, but I, I loved the animated sequences of things like right. that. The, the One of the final scenes where it's like, you see the grandmother undressing and then like the flower petals, like start coming down the screen. It's just beautiful and it's sensitive, but I also think there's, there's something so there, maybe that's a good way to describe the grandmother. Like she is beautiful and delicate and charming in ways, but she's also so fierce. Like that's a woman you wouldn't want to mess with. No. <laughs> so that's just, I think great to see in films in general are those like positive female relationships. And especially when it's that kind of generational thing happening too, where you're seeing someone trying to give knowledge. Like, I mean, she was the elder trying to give knowledge to this, to the youngest female in this family and even like that, the conversation that they're happening about the separation mm-hmm. and Martha comes in, she's like, oh, I hate him. It's the worst thing in the world. And the grandmother's like, oh, I thought someone died. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she's like, and she's like, you're only mad at yourself for making a bad decision. Yep. And that was that, great advice. Uh, amazing. Mm-hmm. No, and maybe that's also something I think that I haven't touched on is that that is very unique in Iranian family. <laughs> Because divorce or separation, embracing sexuality, because I know the film touches on a lot of that too. Like there's a scene where I don't know who these women are too, Marjan, like when they show up, but they're like, oh, like you slept with more than one guy. Uh, Okay. okay. But like they were excited that she slept with a person, but when she was like, oh, she slept with multiple, now you're a slut. These are, these are, there's so many things in this film. Like there's layers. It's like an onion, like Shrek. There, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so onion, uh, ogres have layers. Yeah. There's layers. So there's layers to this film in terms of how it's hitting on culture too, because I related to that so much. See, I think Marjan's character, I relate to in so many ways myself. Like I could see like why this would be a reflection of someone like my mother, but I also see why it's a reflection of like even modern Iranian women like myself too, because we're, we're still dealing with this kind of judgment as well. If I were to get divorced, there are definitely people in my family who'd be like, you're a loser. Like you failed. Like that's horrible. And like, there are probably people who stay in unhappy relationships because of fear of judgment from their family. And like, that's a part of the culture. So I just liked that this film kind of broke a lot of that down. And there's a lot of like healthy relationship stuff that's happening that. It's great to see like the father and the mother being like, yeah, you can come home. We're not going to ask questions. And no one's like asking her or, or, or like making her feel shitty for coming home. Mm -hmm. I mean, I feel like that's a universal thing. Like, like, let's say you went to college, didn't really make it need to come home and stay in like your parents' house. Yeah. (laughs) We all feel embarrassed with that idea, but like, I like that this film like normalized it. So I don't know. That's, those are kind of some like final thoughts I have is that I think it's a great film because of the universal themes, but especially for touching on Iranian culture and for women in this culture, it's very uplifting in a lot of ways because you see a woman who's wanting to embrace a lot of things that would be taboo in her country, but she's like, I don't care. And she had a grandmother who was leading the way that is very unique and also Mm -hmm. extremely appreciated for like someone like me to see. And a lot of, I'm I'm sure I would assume for other Iranian women to see as well. I'm not going to say anything better than that. (laughs) It's fine. (laughs) Wonderful. No, I'm not going to add I'm to it. I'm glad that you watched it is what I'll say, because I think if I, if anything, bringing this film for other people's awareness, I hope that you watch it and I'm glad that you enjoyed it. Yeah, no, <laughs> I, I, a lot. I mean, that's, it's going to be in my regular wheelhouse again. Like I, you know, it's funny. I watched it back then and kind of went away from me and then you brought it up. I'm like, that's a, that's a good pick. I remember that. And <laughs> I was excited to revisit it and I was like, yeah. It's like an underdog, Damn. right? Because I don't think it's 
I even myself might not always remember it, but it's it's such a good film. And for people who love comics, read the comics. They're so good too. What else? This is the segment where we just kind of talk about something we've recently taken in, where it's been books, movies, music, something, or maybe something we wrote or produced or put out and want to share. So, Sharari, what else? I'll bring up something I recently just finished watching, and it was a ride, is The Boys. Oh, yeah. I just finished that recently oh. myself. Oh, my goodness. Or that is Caught a up. Caught up. It's not over. Right. No, exactly. I, um, yeah, I just watched the first two, two seasons. Yes. Uh, yep. Okay. I'm trying, cause I couldn't remember. Cause we just, we just binged whatever was available. So I don't know like how many seasons I was watching. It's a trip. That is a show. And I, I remember being hesitant on watching it initially because mm-hmm. I don't know how else to say this. Like the title didn't grab me. I, I wasn't, uh, cause I think it's a comic, right. Uh, or I'm, 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 I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. I have no idea. Uh-huh. <laughs> so the boys, the boys, the title didn't grab me because I was like, I don't know. This was like, okay, I don't know what this is about. I think I saw like one or two trailers about like superheroes. And I was like, I'm kind of tapped out from like superhero stuff for a minute. My husband's the one who got me into it. He was like, you're going to want to watch this. It's not what you think it is. Is basically what he kept saying. It's like, right. it is not the kind of superhero show you think it's going to be. And I was like, okay. I could not stop watching it. It is a ride. And I think it's because just like he described it, not at all what I was expecting from superheroes. And I actually love that. I love how wild this show is. I love how pretty much every episode, my mouth is just like, (laughs) what happened? At the end, like they actually went there. They actually did it. Yeah, I I thought the show, I I described it as, this is either a big troll job on Zack Snyder or what Zack Snyder thinks he makes when he goes and makes a movie or both. <laughs> I can see that. I don't know. It's funny because they were, all, I mean, I, I mean, this might be like such a like simplified idea of like why I enjoyed it, but it is kind of one of those things where it's like, I was like feeling I was watching like the reality version of like what an, like a, a behind the scenes of like the Avengers. Right. So this is the shit that really goes on. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I had interest in it, uh, you know, I like like Carl Urban. I'm a, I, I always enjoy his work. Yeah. And but like, it, you know, it was a, another superhero show on a stack of superhero shows. And I was like, oh, I'll, I'll get to it. I'll get to it. And then I was like, all right, here we go. It's time. I'm like, OK, this was actually, you know, oh, deconstructive superhero show. Here we go. And it was really good. So I really uh, enjoy it. I'll eat crow. <laughs> I was just like, yeah, I'm sure this is fine, but right and it was good no, it was i'm glad really i good. watched it i think probably one of my favorite scenes which might be for a lot of people is i don't know if i can i spoil things how much can i say or not say there's a there's okay. a disclaimer at the top of the show that's not just for that's not just for the movie we talk about <laughs> okay well then that being said it's hold on the- listener skip like the 15 second 30 second but a couple times yes now, if, go. You're, if you're that if you're like that worried and sensitive basically the storm front kicking ass scene oh that, okay that was like basically because it's they're kicking her ass she's a nazi her ass needs to get kicked and it's such a like it's a great female empowerment scene yeah. it's just a great like fight scene and i just like how all of the guys are kind of like you just sit on back for a minute let them handle this they got Perfect. this it was great. It's all, but also like the courtroom love- scene. That was yeah. <laughs> that I was kind of I am uh, my husband and I. It was literally like like clue for a minute. We were like, who's the person who's exploding these heads? Like yeah. what the hell? Like we all, we had so many theories about so many aspects of the show. Also, I just love Carl Urban's Billy the Butcher. <laughs> like yep. he's like the best. Like that's the reason I kept coming back. I was like, right. I'm here for Billy. Like that's why I'm here. And also, as as horrible as he is, Homelander. You know what it you is. You love it, to hate him, and that's great. Like people never appreciate yes. that very as much. It's like a Cersei Lannister because mm-hmm. it's like it's it's not like a Joffrey. Like I just can't stand that. Like that that's a character where like I would actually skip. I'm like I can't. I literally can't. Mm-hmm. I want to barf watching this person on screen, even though I know it's like an actor. But like I can't watch the character. But 
Homelander is like a Cersei where you're kind of like, hmm, I'm intrigued by yeah. how fucked up this person is. <laughs> and for me also, it's like, I'm like, so is this like a, a great antithesis to like a Captain America? I kind of like it. I like how creepy and weird mm-hmm. and sadistic this person is. So yeah, it is a great like love to hate. It's like uh, like Negan from The Walking Dead for people who like that. It's like, right. this is a fascinating evil person and i'm i'm into it but mostly i was there for billy because there you go he's, he's everything in the show so i don't so many of the characters are but i love him the most <laughs> my what else i guess i since i haven't been on if i haven't recorded in a couple weeks but um <laughs> i guess i'll talk promising young woman that just came out uh to, okay. have you seen that one i it's on my list okay. like it's on I'm my list spoil, but it is <laughs> terrific it, it it's a high rack like oh, you, it's a high rack yeah i okay. it, it's it flips things on its head it goes play like it just feels you know what it's doing but it feels wholly original in its vibe okay. and its motion and it's just it's really interesting what it pulls off but i'll also bump down that i'm continuing through my federico fellini criterion set okay. um i've been updating on this i've watched juliet of the spirits fellini's satiricon and roma and not to be confused with the other roma yeah, go Julia the Spirits is a trip. I wouldn't see Satyricons. It's okay. Uh, it's got some weird stuff. It's very uh, reminds me of Hodorowski's stuff, but it would have been Fellini inspired mm. that. And then Roma's really good. It's just interesting to watch him. He's entering the 1970s in the set. Okay. He's, his he's in color now, and his stylings, just the way he shoots stuff's getting a little bit more different. But um, we okay, also sure. speaking of, we had uh, Mastriani, his daughter, and his. Uh, okay. His uh, baby mama were voicing Persepolis. Oh, the, yes. Obviously. Yeah. Okay. Sorry for me. <laughs> I thought you were to be like, they were here in my book. And apparently that was by design, I think. They wanted those two, uh, Masteroni, because some, they had something with Marcello Masteroni that okay. they, they wanted the connection to it. And so they had both of them voice. Oh, that's so cool. Something like that. But yeah, that ties it up like, like a bow. So, all right, sweet. There we go. So I got a nice roundabout for it. Nice. There we go. I didn't mean for that to happen, and I just realized oh, I like it while it. I was talking. <laughs> so that'll do it for another week on the Brandon Peters or another episode. We're still got more this week. On the Brandon Peters Show, Sharare. This has been magnificent, and you're truly one of my favorite Homo sapiens. Thank you for coming back and the wealth of experience that you've shared today. And let people know where they can keep up with you on. The um, let's see, y'all. Y'all can keep up with me on the Twitters. It's just going to be at Sharare Drury. I'm on Instagram at Sharare Delara. And, uh, you know, I actually just got on TikTok, people. So I'm Sharare Delara on there, too. And it's S-H-A-R-A-R-E-H is the first name. And Delara is D-E-L-A-R-A. That's actually my middle name, so. But catch me on those. TikTok is going to be probably the weirdest social platform for me yet because i have no idea what i'm doing <laughs> that's the best that's the best right. experimental experimental exactly okay and i'm on twitter and instagram at brand of 4k uhd my written work is at why so blue.com there's more from the show this week including the series one finale of old space show for space 1999 season one on wednesday but until then always remember to keep the positivity in your online film discussion Thank you for listening. The Brandon Peters Show is a Creative Zombie Studios production. Produced by Brad Shoemaker and Brandon Peters. Written and edited by Brandon Peters. Announcer vocals by Jessica Olsman. Theme song by Metavari. Web design and show art by Brad Shoemaker with Brandon Peters. All music and clips featured in the episode are property of their respective studios and no infringement is intended. Additional information on this and other episodes at brandonpetershow.com. For any inquiries, press opportunities, or sponsorship, contact mail at brandonpetershow.com. The show is available on Apple Music, Spotify, or anywhere podcasts are found.
La veille de mon départ, ma mamie vint dormir chez nous. Tous les matins, elle cueillait des fleurs de jasmin qu'elle mettait dans son soutien-gorge pour sentir bon. Quand elle dégraffait son corsage, les fleurs tombaient de ses seins. C'était magique. « Mamie, comment tu fais pour avoir des seins aussi ronds à ton âge ?»« Je les mets dix minutes chacun dans un bol d'eau glacée tous les jours. » Tu me manqueras. Je viendrai te voir. Écoute, je n'aime pas te faire la morale, mais je vais te donner un conseil qui te servira à jamais. Dans la vie, tu rencontreras beaucoup de cons. S'ils te blessent, dis-toi que c'est la bêtise qui les pousse à te faire du mal. Ça t'évitera de répondre à leur méchanceté, car il n'y a rien de pire au monde que l'amertume et la vengeance. Reste toujours digne et intègre à toi-même. »